we're back. We're live. One o'clock rock here on Research in Manoa, our weekly Monday show about science at UH, and specifically at the School of Ocean and Earth, Ocean and Earth Science and at uh, its division, HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And an old friend joins us, Andrea Gabrielli. He's a research and a PhD candidate there. And the last time he was around, uh, he, he came and talked to us about hyperspectral imaging of uh, I guess volcanoes and lava and eruptions and all that. And now we're talking about sort of the kissing cousin of that subject. We're talking about magma chambers down below. Exactly, Jay. Great to be back. Thanks for having me here. Absolutely. <laughs> so magma chambers, um, and the official title is uh, journeyed into the heart, into the heart of the volcano. Wow. Yeah. Today we're going to go um, the. Um, um, last time we talked about, uh, as you said, hyperspectral imaging and how we could actually map volcanic gases, what they could tell us about uh, eruptions and all that. But today we're going to go within the volcano, so we're going to talk about what happens below the crust within the edifice of the volcano. This is very interesting stuff because I, you know, people don't really know. They just know that the volcano erupts. That's what volcanoes do. But we're talking about the, the process of eruption before it happens. Exactly. And, and if we can have maybe the, the first slide up, okay. we, we, we can see. We have some slides. Oops, what is that now? Oh, this is a, a very familiar view for, for those of us who live in Hawaii. This is the summit of Kilauea Volcano. And you can see that's the... Halema'oma'o vent. Within the vent, there is another crater. They call it the Overlook vent. That's where there is the lava lake from which you can see the reddish glow coming from it. So, uh, magma chambers. This, this, magma, this magma comes from within the volcano, and particularly there are lots of sources. In Hawaii, for example, it comes from the, the so-called hotspot which is stationary with respect to the Pacific plate that moves. So this is why we have an island chains. Uh -huh. uh, for example, in other areas, uh, we, we can have uh, subduction zones, so a plate uh, subducting beneath mm. another one. Yeah. Yes. And then this Huge material, forces involved. Huge, huge forces. forces yeah. Huge earthquakes that the energy can be can be released, but also the material that go down is partially melt. It me the, the as it goes down, the pressure increases and and it, it gets hot, and so this material can rise again for uh, with buoyancy towards the surface, and that's the phenomenon that originates, for example, volcanism on the Cascades. So Cascade with, with Mountains, the Cascade Mountains from. Uh, in Oregon. Washington, Oregon, and, yeah. and Northern California. Yeah. So such as Mount Rainier, Hood, Lassen, or, or, or St. Helens. Yeah. Well, I have so many questions about these magma chambers. First of all, um, how deep are they? I mean, are they, are they right below the surface? Are they right below where the lava is erupting out of the volcano? Or are they way down there? There are The, the depth, of course, changes for, for these magma chambers, and there the, the can be multiple magma chambers in a, in a volcano as well. That's actually what we have here at Kilauea Volcano, because we have multiple magma chambers within the same edifice, and people are mapping these thanks to earthquakes. Because as the seismic waves travel to, into, the, into the edifice of the volcano, once the, the rock breaks and the waves are propagating, the velocity of these waves change with the, the, with the material. So if it's liquid, if it's solid, if it's partially melt, the velocity is different. And so that's how people can map these magma chambers. Okay, but hyperspectral imaging not going to help you. You have I've to have different tools then for an eruption itself. There are a variety of tools that are used to forecast volcanic eruptions. This, um, this work we're doing here at the University of Hawaii with hyperspectral imaging can help us uh, um, detecting gases. And, so, and gases can help us in, in fear what's going on within the volcano. So what's the principle? If I see a certain gas coming out, uh, now it's not erupting yet, right? It's, but I see a certain gas coming out, this is going to tell you that it will erupt, and it's going to tell you something about the chamber below. How do you determine that? It's the, it's the depth of exolution of the, these gases from the magma, from Exolution. the bulk of the magma. Exol How do you spell that? 
E X S O L U T I O N. Okay, nobody solution. knew that before. But th th that's basically as the magma rises towards the surface, the pressure decreases. So as the pressure decreases, gases are being released, are exhaled from the main bulk of the magma. And the, the interesting thing is that these gases exhaled are released at different depths. Yeah. So this is, can tell us where the, mag, where the magma that is degassing is actually is as we measure these gases on the surface. And it comes but through the, the rock. The gas comes through the rock. Comes through it the rock. Pops right up. And, and, this, and this journey, we, we're going to go into a magma chamber. So this journey starts in the city of Lancaster. It, that's in the northwestern part of England. That's where I studied. That's where I did my master with Professor Lionel Wilson, okay. who is also a visiting professor here at the University of Hawaii. Ah. And so if we can have, there it is. Here, that's, that's, that's Lancaster? The, that's the beautiful city of Lancaster. It was founded in the, in the first century as a Roman fort, a permanent <laughs> Roman fort. You right? can see on the left uh, the tower bell of the cathedral in the center, the, 12th, the, the, the castle which dates back to the 12th century, and the river Loon on the right that goes into the Morkane Bay. But what we're interested in today are the mountains uh, that, you can, that you can barely see in the background of these images. There's a red circle around Where there? I drew the red circle. That's okay. right. That's yeah. where we're going. Because this area is, uh, is, the, is the British Lake District. That's an area that, were, that, that was uh, chanted by the romantic poets uh, Coleridge, uh, Samuel oh, Taylor right? Coleridge, <laughs> William Wordsworth. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful area. Yeah. But 450 million years ago, at the, in the early Ordovician period, that's what they call it, that area was actually a volcanic arc, so it was characterized by volcanic eruption, and the geology is similar to the volcanic arc of islands that we can see in the West Pacific today. It was an area, uh, uh, and, and so, of course, the now, after 450 million years ago, volcanoes uh, the, uh, are, of course, inactive. They're not active anymore. But the landscape that, that, that is still there is amazing for geology research. Uh, and there are field trips from, from the local university there, the University of Lancaster, and people can go and really understand how uh, volcanoes work from beneath. And so when you don't think of you know, England or London or Lancaster as a place of volcanoes and eruptions, but they were. They were, and, and there is a very nice place in Edinburgh, in the city of Ed Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, the castle, the main castle of the city is built on a, on a, on a, on a volcanic structure. So ah. that, that's a, when you go there, you enjoy the castle, but some people uh, are not aware that it's actually built on what prehistorically was an ancient volcano. So if you have a volcano, including an ancient volcano, you always have a magma chamber below, right? You cannot have a volcano and an eruption without having a magma chamber below, am I right? Usually as the, uh, as the, the, the activity, the volcanism develops in an area, the magma tends to rise and then form this, this magma pools where the magma is gathered and is stationary. So yeah, usually we, we do have these. And uh, north of England, if we go to these mountains in Cumbria, yeah. we can see exactly how a magma chamber looks like. And it might be different from what you might expect. Okay. If, if we have the, we have the a picture next... picture of that too. Here we go. <laughs> what is that now? That's a, that's a chamber orchestra. Is that <laughs> well, of course, 450 million years ago, uh -huh. the orchestra wasn't there. I guarantee. This is the chamber playing in the but, chamber. But the, the chamber. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> but this, this, this area, this area. So he, he, this is a mine. This is a slate mine in Cumbria, Honister yeah. mine, uh -huh. and. Uh, it's a slate mine, so people go there to extract the slate, slate material. Yeah, yeah. But this whole area was formed during volcanic eruptions. And particularly, we are, we are interested in the, in the ceiling, in the background of this image. You can see the ceiling, it's tilted. That's a 30 degrees angle. Yeah. And that's a sill. That's a magmatic sill. It's not slate itself. It's not slate. The slate was created 
uh, over millions of years uh, of years by metamorphism. Ah. So not only the, the original magma, but the, 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 the initial rock, the debris from the eruptions within this volcano were deformed by heat and pressure over millions of years, and that's what created the slate. But the volcanic um, structure is still there. Yeah. Now, you know, if, if the orchestra, the, the, the chamber <laughs> orchestra, could go down in there, it's not that far below the surface, right? It's not far below the surface, and, in the, and usually they organize these events during the summer because it's quite an interesting area. I it's bet quite the an acoustics interesting. must be beautiful in, in I, a chamber. I, I, I bet, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, seal, the, the, the rock we're looking at this, 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 uh, in the background, that, that's basically a sill. So we're talking about a body of magma that was intruded horizontally within two existing layers of rocks. So a magma chamber is not actually, as some people um, might think uh, during simplification, we try to simplify, but sometimes we oversimplify, it's not actually a body, a spherical body of magma within the volcano. It's much more complex. It's a river of magma. It, it's, it's an ensemble of these uh, structures. Did you say ensemble? Ensemble. That they use that it's term in, in connection with orchestras. So that's why we I have the orchestra so. it again. It all connects. It's all together. <laughs> it's all connect. It all connects. I know. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, an ensemble of these uh, structures I was showing you in the pictures of the orchestra. So an ensemble of sills, which are this body of magmas that were intruded horizontally, yeah. and also dikes, which is kind of the same thing, but they're smaller and they're usually vertical. Yeah. So it's an ensemble of these features. And it, it, we, in, the, in the next slide, we can actually see a diagram. So there, there, th okay. this, is, this is a scheme, this is a diagram. It's a figure showing how a magma chamber might actually look like. So you can see it's not an ellipsoid, it's not a sphere, but it's, it's, a, it's a combination of all these dikes and sills within the, within the edifice of the volcano. Now we saw a picture, so we know that you know, the floor of the ceiling is so far apart, you know, it looked like 20, 30 feet maybe, mm -hmm. um, but it could be bigger or it could be smaller, right? Absolutely. It's, dif it's difficult to, usually people talk about diameter, but as I said, it's little, it, they can, we can talk about the diameter of the whole, uh, of the whole material, which include both the material that is melt and the material that is partially melt. Mm -hmm. So once I was having a conversation uh, with a, petro a petrologist here at the University of Hawaii, and we were talking about different uh, size, different hypotheses, because the geophysical, um, the geophysical uh, uh, instruments, geophysical instruments tell you the difference in velocity of the, of the seismic waves. So that gives you an estimate of the volume of the, of the material. But that gives you the estimate of the material that is melt and also the material that is partially melt. So is it, and so petrologists usually focus on both. Yeah. In, the, in, the, in the work I've been doing in England, what we considered was just the melt, not yeah. the partially melt. So yeah. we wanted to avoid that yeah. because it was more complicated to model. We tried to simplify it a little bit, but still having a, reliable result. We tested these models on Kilauea and, and other volcanoes to try and really understand what happens as the magma chamber gets pressurized. So pressure is one thing that uh, it, it's, a, it's a factor in the development of the chamber, in the size of the chamber, the way the, the pseudopods reach out, you know, the, mm -hmm. the little <laughs> tributaries reach out. <clears throat> but there's another, you mentioned also the seismic activity. So it sounds like it's pressure, and it's also a combination of pressure and seismic activity that and push the magma against the wall of the chamber, no? And gases as well. And gases. So uh, in the picture, in the, in the figure we showed below, we were looking at this magma chamber. And then as the magma chamber inflates, because more material is added, comes from beneath and is added to the chamber, then the pressure increase, increases, as you said, but also it inflates. So this inflation causes ruptures in the, in the rocks surrounding the magma chambers. And so that's how we have earthquakes. 
So we have earthquake. So what volcanologists are interested in are three main things to try and, and, and um, forecast these eruptions. The first one is the formation. So they measure how the edifice, how the shape of the edifice is changing. And so they, and they can tell this by measuring gravity, using tiltimeters and other instruments. That, but also you, you can't go in there, right? You, you can't go in a magma chamber. Well, you can go if it's uh, if it's uh, if empty, it's, if as it's the empty. one as the one in Cumbria, as right, the one but, in Cumbria. But if it's got ha hot magma, that's no. not a good idea. <laughs> not a good and, idea. And you can't put instruments in there either because it's too hot, right? But the beauty. How hot is it? Well, the the temperature of the magma is two thousand degrees Fahrenheit. And so it's it, rock. This and magma and it, is and, rock. And magma is magma is a, is a combination of rock, rock melt melted rocks and the gases, which are dissolved into this liquid, into this hot liquid melt. And the, the, so the first one as I, is earth, um, deformation. And then we have earthquakes activity. And the third component of, of um, this, um, um, me uh, this measurements that volcanologists do is actually gases. So we, we have three, um, three um, things that we can measure to try and forecast how this magma is moving within, the, within these chambers. Okay, we're gonna, when we come back, we're going to find out the characteristics of that movement. We're also going to find out what happens when the hot magma, you know, touches the edges of the chamber. What happens, what kind of reaction happens there, and how come you can have a, a chamber orchestra within the chamber and that's not falling down on you? <laughs> Okay, just asking just curious questions here uh, on ThinkTech. Andrea Gabrielli, a researcher at HIGP at SOWEST on Research in Manoa. We'll be right back for more. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi, and you can catch me on Mondays at 11 on ThinkTech Hawaii. Stacy to the rescue. See you then. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. If you want to be an informed citizen, we invite you to watch every week as we bring wonderful guests together on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network every Monday at 2 o'clock p.m. We talk with people who know what they're talking about when it comes to the economy or the government or to building a better society. So we'll see you then on Ehana Kako, which means let's work together every Monday at 2 o'clock p.m on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live with Andrea Gabrielli, a researcher at HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, here on our Monday show at 1 o'clock every Monday, Research in Manoa. And uh, as we left this exciting journey, it was a journey <laughs> into the chamber, into the heart of the volcano. Uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, these, these three things you can measure. And uh, my curiosity point is exactly how does that magma affect the walls of the chamber? Does it burn them off? Does it make them so hot they become part of the magma? Or, you know, does the chamber cool the magma? And what happens at the point of contact? The point, the, that's an excellent question. That's what we're, we're actually trying to do with this modeling of chambers. This is what petrologists do. Basically, the, the rock that surrounds the magma chamber gets hot, as you said, because of the contact with the magma within the chamber. And then, it, 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 because of the pressure it is subjected to, it can go and, and, and be metamorphosed. So the, sh the, the, the nature of this rock is changed by the heat and the pressure. But as you move, uh, as you move away from the, from the chamber and the temperature decreases, then you have a brittle, a brittle uh, behavior of these rocks. And those fingers that are moving away, that's, that's going to be cooler than in the center of the chamber. Then in the center, and as these, these, these fingers, these, these dikes and sills uh, propagate uh, through the, these, layer, these layers of existing rocks, then uh, there are earthquakes uh, and, uh, and it's brittle. But the material that is closer to the chamber is actually partially melt, so the deformation is more plastic. But then as you go away, it becomes brittle, it can break. And so we have earthquakes and, and, and other activity. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, one question has to come up is that, 
in, in that in that picture, that graphic we just looked at, which is really to me an important picture that we to understand. You show a flow of magma coming from down below, mm -hmm. um, and it's coming in a fairly defined pathway there. How does how does where does it come from, and how does it move, and does it burn up everything in its path, or does that path already exist? Again. Usually, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's formed, this conduit that we talk about is actually formed by many dikes. So these, uh, these fingers, we can call them, that propagate through existing layers of rock. But it, it's usually, as I said, many dikes that propagate. And again, so those are bigger dikes than the little finger dikes. Usually, you can go on the east side here on Oahu, there, there are some exposed dikes from the ancient Ko'olau volcano, or you can go towards the Waianae coast, and even there, there are some, towards Kahena Point, there are some pretty impressive dikes. Usually they are two, three meters in, in, in size, but they can be kilometers long, but the thickness is usually two, three meters, and, so they're not... The, the kilometers long, you mean horizontal direction? In, in, uh, in, uh, they're, they're like a, um, a curtain, so they're like, uh, for example, the, the thickness is like two, three meters, but then they extend yeah. like that for... for um, but, but are you saying that in the, the center of the Earth, there is one great big magma chamber, and it expresses itself um, in, in fingers of one of larger size and then smaller size all the way up? Um, the, this magma, it, it has different origins, but particularly, for example, here in Hawaii, the magma is originating down within the mantle, so not at the center. The center is solid. It's a nickel and iron um, sphere that rotates very quickly and creates a geomagnetic uh, field of the Earth, but that's solid. What creates the heat of the magma that is above that core? The, so this dates back to the formation of the, of the solar system 4.5 billion years ago when th millions of these tiny little objects uh, called planetesimals were colliding and through accretion they formed the planets. Now as the, a planet was becoming bigger and also became uh, um, a sphere, more spherical, the pressure and the heat within the, the center of the planet uh, basically is, is still trapped there today. And that's part, that's basically 20% of the heat budget uh, from the from from uh, from a planet, the rest comes from radioactive decay of elements of, of heavier elements. The but seventy, yeah. I mean, we have radioactive elements in the down toward when you get down toward the core. Uh, not towards the core. This, this this is we're talking about the mantle. So the mantle. We, right. So we have we have the, the the inner core, the outer core, and then the mantle. So we're okay. talking about. But for example, as I said, in the Cascades or in other locations, yeah. the origin of the magma is much more superficial. It's much more, it, it's, it's as this, this uh, 90, 80, 90 kilometers below the crust. That's where the magma from the subduction zone is melted and then it can, it can go up again. So the, 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 but the core is actually um, solid. And, so and it's it, not hot necessarily. And it's very hot, oh, it's absolutely very hot. Very very hot. But it's not liquid. But it's yeah. solid. Okay, okay. But it's solid. Now, you were talking about these three ways that you can do um, scientific investigation on the material in the, in the, in the, in the magma chamber. Um, what kind of instruments do you use in order to measure those three uh, indicators? Oh, we measure, we measure seismology. We, we use seismo uh, uh, instruments to develop, to, to measure seismic waves, the seismographs. We use, uh, as I said earlier, tiltimeters. We use... Uh, uh, we, that's to for measure deformation, and we use also FTIR, uh, Fourier transform spectrometers, to try and measure gases or hyperspectral. That's a new technology we're testing. Um, but these three techniques to measure how the edifice of the volcano behaves in response to the inflation of the magma chamber are also particularly useful to study external stresses. What could cause a trigger of a volcanic eruption, because sometimes uh, the, the inner pressure is not enough to trigger, actually trigger a volcanic eruption. And I believe we have a slide that will bring us to, oh, here we go. This is Etna Volcano. 
So here we go back to Italy. And you can see in this image, uh, we are looking at the north, northern uh, slope of the, of, the, uh, of the volcano. That's the northern flank. Well, what mountain is this? Etna. That's a volcano yeah. in, in, in Italy, in, southern, mm -hmm. in Sicily. You can see next to the center of the image, a little bit towards the left, that's the summit. It's, it's, it's covered in snow. You can see there is a vent that is degassing, and the top of the vent uh, is, uh, is, uh, is not covered in snow because the soil, the rocks are hot over there. But what I want to draw your attention to is uh, the red line that I drew. That line is basically a fault. It's a line of fault, so it's a zone of weakness within the volcano. Now, what happens is that the, the flank of volcanoes can move along these zones of weakness. And so, if, for example, there was a, a, a landslide or an event that could move the flank of the volcano, then there, there would be a depressurization of the magma chamber, and that could induce uh, an eruption. So, for example, on... Uh, in, um, How do you tell where to, where to draw that line? Because we can see these, these fractures within the rocks. You, you, can, you can eyeball them. We can see fissures. We can see fissures and, and cracks. That's how you determine. So were you there or are you looking for photographs? We were there. Yeah. We were there. Okay. But we, were, we, we also look at these movements from satellites. So we can tell whether the, the flank of a volcano is moving by also looking at differences from satellites and... and, uh, and um, and, yeah. uh, and measure these things. But the, the, the interesting part is that, for example, an example of this, this depressurization of the edifice is actually on May the 18th, 1980, when Mount St. Helens started to erupt. The actual, the, the initial blast, uh, if you remember the picture, was horizontal. The, the, mountain, the eruption started, the blast was horizontal because it was not actually triggered by the pressure of the magma within the chamber. It was actually triggered by a landslide. So the volcano... Which was caused by the pressure earthquake, from the magma. Which was caused by an earthquake. Okay. So the, 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 ma the mountain was already pressurized. The volcano was already pressurized because of the, because of the magma that was injected. And the, the northern flank of the volcano was really deformed. And on that morning, there was a strong earthquake. The, the northern flank of the volcano started to slide down over existing layers of rocks. Subduction. Oh, no. That we, here we're talking about... Uh, subduction is, is, is between plates. Here we're talking about uh, an edifice of a volcano. So we're talking about a landslide. That's a, a, a different uh, okay. uh, uh, phenomenon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But this 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 movement, this movement of the of the edifice of the volcano that slided down, caused the decompression of the chamber, and so that uh, induced the, the the main blast, the main explosion at Mount. So they're Alex. different. These uh, these experiences, these phenomena are different. I, I wanted to ask you one more question be, be, before we go, and that is. <clears throat> Are you now in a better position to predict where and when and how forceful a volcanic eruption will be because of this technology? We, we are definitely trying to do our best to predict volcanic eruptions. Of course, there's still the much still to be discovered, the still much to be investigated, but, but we're, we're, we're for sure we are on the right track because with this technology, with this new instrument, we can really peek into the earth, into the, earth, into the heart of the volcano, as you yeah. were saying, and so we can, we can understand really the dynamics of, of what happens within the volcano. And one thing is clear, volcanic eruptions aren't going away anytime soon. We're going to have more. We're going to need to predict them. That's uh, Andrea Gabrelli. Uh, he's a researcher. Gabrielli, he's a researcher at HIGP, the Hawaiian Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at SOWEST here on Research in Manoa. And uh, we want you to come back again soon. We want to follow everything you do. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Aloha. Aloha.